good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all across the globe. So uh, just a tiny bit of history that uh, Metodora was one of the first women physicians who wrote on the diseases and cures of for women somewhere in the first century. So we know many women pathbreakers with outstanding contribution in science, Madame Curie, Virginia Apker, and Rosalind Franklin, to name a few, which all of us would be familiar with. So although women are the backbone constituting about 75% of the healthcare workforce across the globe, only 25% are senior leaders. As the world evolves, so does the role of women as leaders and inspirational forces. We need to recognize potential and talent and promote more women into leadership positions. So the Women Leaders in Pediatric Oncology Network was essentially aimed to promote female leadership in pediatric oncology and to build the next generation of talented female professionals in pediatric oncology. And we aim to do this through events, role modeling, and networking opportunities. On behalf of the Women Leaders in Pediatric Oncology, I welcome all of you to our flagship online event where three trailblazers give us an insight of their journey. So just a little bit of the agenda, the translation in French and Spanish is available. If you all click on the globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will be directed to whichever uh, language you want. The questions are welcome. Please type them in the Q&A box and the recording will soon be available on the YouTube channel. So the first person we have today, first speaker, is Dr. Laurie Wiener, who's at the Center for Cancer Research at the National Cancer Institute in the United States. She is co-director of the Behavioral Health Corps and head of the Psychosocial Support and Research Program. As both a clinician and behavioral scientist, Dr. Wiener has developed a robust clinical and research program that has focused on critical clinical issues such as parental coping, lone parenting, transnational parenting, sibling and sibling donor experiences, craft versus host disease, and end-of-life planning. Dr. Wiener led the team that has developed the first evidence-based psychosocial standards of care for children with cancer and their family members. She has published over 250 publications spanning peer-reviewed papers and book chapters, co-edit the textbooks of pediatric psychooncology. I'll I, I I can go on and on, but I'll stop here and hand over the mic to Dr. Wiener. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And I'll try to share my screen. I'll, I'll stop. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. All right. I am so truly honored to be part of this prestigious panel. And when thinking about the trajectory of the past 40 plus years, I really struggled with where to start. But for each of us, there's a story. My beginnings in oncology began in 1981 in a blistery Sunday morning in New York City when I was searching the New York Times employment section, not at all sure what I was looking for. I just knew that the work that I was doing at the time, outpatient mental health during the day and private practice at night was missing something. And one ad for an opening at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center struck me as intriguing. I cut it out and put it in the maybe pile, but then I put it away. What was I thinking? I had no hospital or cancer experience. But the next day I found myself picking it up again, but again, I put the ad away. The third day, I said to myself, there must be a reason that I have not thrown this out. So I applied, and a week later, I went for the first of several interviews. At the end of the fourth interview, I was asked a pretty brilliant question. Tell me why you are really here. I remember being honest and said that I'm trying to figure this out myself, that I was looking for a way to use my clinical skills in a way that feels more meaningful. Her response? Thank you very much for taking the time to come in here today. I was sure I blew it. But several weeks later, I was offered the position, and I still wonder if I was their second, third, or fourth choice. I did not have an easy start. 
My learning curve was huge, first in terms of cancer terminology, but my biggest challenge was witnessing such extreme fear and grief and remarkable awe at their resilience. There were still two patients that remained vivid in my mind. Angelica, a beautiful and articulate 24-year-old woman with AML, and Vincent, a 19-year-old, funny and engaging young gay man with rhabdo rhabdomyosarcoma who underwent very disfiguring head and neck surgery. I observed their sense of disbelief at their diagnosis, their hopes and dreams and fears and anxieties that waxed and waned with the day-to-day -day medical events and treatments and biopsies and scans. The truth, I was not at all prepared for this work. I would listen, reflect, inquire, but overall, I felt useless. Their pain was so palpable. I eventually convinced myself that these people needed someone who could truly help them, not some 20-something-year-old with so little to offer. Perhaps worse, I was carrying their pain and frustration with me. I found myself constantly recalibrating my priorities. I pushed friends away. Their problems just seemed inconsequential. And I only found comfort in my passion, photography, spending increasing amounts of time witnessing life and searching for beauty from behind the scenes, but from behind the lens. And the accumulation of my angst, not surprisingly, was each of their deaths in less than a year. I stood by as Angelica bled out, an experience to this day I will never forget, or her parents' shriek of horror. I was with Vincent as he died, and this was the first time I witnessed agitation in the face of air hunger. Each of their deaths and the many subsequent deaths took a toll on me. It was my mother who gave me very wise advice. Give this six months, Lori. If it continues to destroy you and your spirit, this is not the right field for you. If, on the other hand, you could have an emotional energy for a life outside of work, then this, me this work may bring you great meaning. But get professional help so you don't have to figure this out alone. I followed her advice. And slowly, I learned to refocus my attention from my very lengthy laundry list of inadequacies to begin to realize that maybe I wasn't as useless as I imagined. And while I desperately wanted to run out of the room when the bleeding could not be stopped and breathing became labor labored or parents began to fight, I didn't. I remained present to witness what the family was experiencing, to listen, acknowledge the magnitude of the loss that was about to occur and to model and encourage touch sometimes, despite my own fear. Fear actually turned out to be a great motivator. It was less than a year at Memorial, I was asked to help the chief of dermatology with the mental health needs of young gay men who were presenting to their department with rare opportunist infections, Kaposi sarcoma and mental health challenges. This was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, but we didn't realize that then. What a frightening time this was due to the stigma, fear, and so many losses. It was during this time that I had the opportunity to develop the first psychosocial support and research program for persons with what was then referred to as GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. If you read the book and the band plays on, you wouldn't know how many women were at the front lines caring for these patients. Believe me, they were. And it was during this time that I realized I really needed more training and began to pursue a PhD program at NYU. It was those years that prepared me for the next phase of my career. I had gotten married. My husband took a position in Baltimore, Maryland. And immediately after taking my comps, I began interviewing in the Maryland, D.C. area. And in January 1986, began to work at NIH to help fill up PISO to help incorporate pediatric HIV into the um, existing pediatric oncology program. I never expected to be what people affectionately called NIH lifers. And that first year was painful too. There were very few pediatric oncology staff who wanted to work with children and families with AIDS and some staff left. But we persevered and almost 600 patients later, the first treatments for children with AIDS were approved. And during this time, I was able to develop a robust research portfolio studying really unique aspects of children and families living with AIDS, such as diagnosis disclosure, impact of public disclosure, affected siblings, fathering a child with AIDS, psychiatric manifestations and AIDS bereavement. But most important to me, I was able to capture the voices of the children through their art and words and complete my PhD. And with treatments now available in 2005, our program phased out. 
and I returned to the pediatric AYA oncology world. And here I was able to create a model that has continued through today and to work with an amazing team in the development of psychosocial standards of care. I'm really sorry for interrupting, Dr. Wiener. Yes. Uh, could you just go a little bit slower because they're being unable to translate? Ah, okay. So Thank what, you. Thanks. What has the, I went to New Yorker, always a New Yorker. What has this program looked like over the last 17 years? Well, first, to provide excellent psychosocial care in the form of clinical services to patients and families to enhance coping and adaptation. And it's what we learn from our patients and families that help us to be able to think about the research questions that are most important to ask, generally those that there really isn't any data on and that are novel. And then what we learn from our clinical services and our research, we then are able to take and to develop and implement and evaluate new resources that can then be distributed throughout the world. The most important part is the continual integration of clinically identified and research generated projects. Let me show you some examples. But first, being able to look in the, in the AIDS world, the, living, um, the lived experience for children and families with AIDS, textbooks, the psychosocial standards of care, and most recently, a special issue um, looking at psychosocial issues um, for children and adolescents living with rare diseases. But perhaps more important to me, was being able to develop therapeutic and educational resources for children and for their parents and caregivers. These are all available we'll see, for free on our website. Storybooks for children, an advanced care planning guide for adolescents and young adults, an electronic screening tool called Checking In, which is now available um, through the cancer support community, and therapeutic games the most recent of which is the CAR-T road trip to help children who are going to be undergoing CAR-T therapy be prepared. So what are the lessons that I've learned through this process? Well, first, every family comes with a story. And I never stop being amazed by how important the sharing of stories can be to the relationships that we have with families. A wonderful grief counselor by the name of Dr. Alan Wolfert wrote, a life without story is like a book without pages. Nice to see, but lacking in substance. Plus there's healing in the telling, which is why I love to be able to create storybooks and workbooks. Not only can't we cure everyone, we can fix or resolve all the issues that our families face. Some will find new doors to open and others will not be able to find the peace we know they so desperately are searching for. But there are things we can do. Patients will always remember how you spoke to them, how you made them feel. Just, just your consistent presence is a true gift. Choose your mentors wisely, not just people who think the same way about problems that you do, but persons who will challenge you and introduce you to others to help you grow. And always remember your mentors and their birthdays. Recognize unhealthy or even toxic work relationships for what they are. I have found resolving even small grievances early is critically important. They will fester and can make your work life miserable. Is there something you need or want? It never hurts to ask. You will never know if you don't. And as my colleague, Dr. Marilyn Powell would say, and be shovel ready, fully prepared with whatever your plans are in case you get the surprising yes. What is a comfortable work-life balance for one person may not be the same for you. Find what brings you joy. Ask yourself whether what you do each day when you wake up aligns with your values. Help those you are mentoring to do the same. Something that I have not mastered is that it is okay to say no so that you could say yes to yourself more often. So if the ask is will impact the quality of your life, listen to that voice. And this work is emotionally challenging, especially when patients you care for deeply cannot be cured. Find a way to grieve each loss as they occur. Rituals help. Those cumulative losses will take a physical and emotional toll on the hardiest among us. But know the difference between being sad and being depressed. This work could be sad. Reach out for support if you're struggling. Stay connected with others in the field. SIOP is a fabulous organization. Persistent um, professional isolation leads to burnout 
while professional connections can help us grow, stay current, learn new skills, and obtain much needed personal nurturance. I have found teamwork and collaborations to be a key antidote for burnout. And conferences may be a great time to get out and explore new places. Thank you, Dr. Kazak and Thompson for that one. And finally, you may have a bucket list of places to visit and things to do in your personal life. Keep a bucket list of professional goals. I know one of mine has been to give a talk on most of the world continents. Unfortunately, COVID got in the way of that, South America and Asia, but I will still keep this on my bucket list. And we can't be able to do this work without amazing mentors and colleagues. And the first is Jimmy Holland for creating the field of psycho-oncology and providing me an opportunity to build a pediatric track through APOS. At NCI, none of my work would have been possible without Dr. Philip Pizzo. Bill believed in me and what I could accomplish way before I believed in myself. And there are just not enough words to describe his skills as an oncologist, leader, teacher, and soon-to-be spiritual guide. My wonderful branch chiefs that gave me carte blanche to study and create the programs that we thought could enhance the care provided at NIH. To my wonderful colleagues and friends, Dr. Wood, Weaver, Mitchell, Thompson, Powell, Wakeville, Kazak, I, there's so many more I could be able to put down here. And next to Anne is a little boy by the name of Maddie. Maddie and his wonderful parents, Vicki and Peter Brown, is what, what really inspired and led the standards of care. And a very special acknowledgement to my family, my parents who taught me from a very young age the values of helping others, my husband who has stood by and patiently accepted my crazy work hours, and my own children for being secure in the intensity of my love while sharing me with so many other children in need, and of course, our fabulous four-legged rescue besties. Not pictured here, as all of us could say, is those patients and families who have shared their deepest hopes and dreams with me and have allowed me to be their voice in sharing them with others. They will forever be my teachers. So I very quickly went through over four decades. The last question is the future. That story is yet to be told. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vino. That was absolutely wonderful to know, you know, I think for anybody to know how they go through, uh, you know, their whole life when you start, when you're a, you know, enthusiastic student, and then to manage to go, keep your enthusiasm going for the next 40 years. Um, I think I'll uh, hand over to Faith for the Q&A, or do we want them at the end? I think we're going to do Q&A at the end, Amita. So I think we're okay. going to go Perfect. through the speakers and then... Uh, Q and A at the end. I think that will work brilliantly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now it's an absolute pleasure to have Rachel on Hollis on board with us. And whenever I've met her a few times at Psyop meetings, I've always uh, felt, you know, so good meeting her because she's so inspirational. So she's an honorary nurse advisor at the Leeds Teaching Hospitals in pediatric oncology in the United Kingdom and has spent more than 30 years working in pediatric hematology and oncology in Leeds itself, and has been involved in developing services for children and young people with cancer in the United Kingdom and the local and the national level. She's been a long-standing nurse member of uh, SIOP, having served on the nursing committee and author of the SIOP baseline standards for pediatric oncology nursing care and in addition, she has been engaged with the Global Healthcare Network, which is now becoming really important, especially for promoting nursing care in the low and middle income countries. She works alongside nurse members of SIOP and the international colleagues in especially to integrate uh, nursing into the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. Uh, Rachel was made fellow of the United Kingdom Royal College of Nursing in recognition of her work and chairs the Professional Nursing Committee of the Royal College of Nursing. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Amita, and thank you for that um, nice introduction. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm now sharing my screen, and could you just confirm that for me? Yes, yep. it's absolutely fine. Looks great. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, so as uh, Anita says, I'm a, I'm a nurse. I work in the United Kingdom and I live in the beautiful county of North Yorkshire, um, where it's very cold being um, winter today. So greetings to everybody from, from the UK and from, from Yorkshire. Uh, like Laurie, I'm going to talk first about my um, nursing journey, um, similar length of time, I think. So for, for four decades working um, in nursing. Uh, and when I sort of mapped it out, it looks fairly well ordered and, and quite planned going through from being a, a student to a, a staff nurse in paediatric oncology to a ward sister to a, a lead nurse for children's cancer. But actually, it wasn't planned like that at all. Um, so I started my nurse training back in 1982. Um, I trained as an adult nurse. I had no particular interest in paediatrics. In fact, the paediatric placement was the one that I was probably looking forward to the least when I did my training. Um, but I got to the children's ward at St Mary's Hospital in London, where I did my training and felt that actually children's nursing was probably where I wanted to be. So I continued um, for a short time in adults before then going on to train as a children's nurse. Um, not quite sure where that would take me. Um, during that training, then I had a placement on the paediatric oncology ward. Again, it wasn't a placement I was particularly looking forward to. I thought the work would be difficult. But when I walked on the ward, um, I realised that that was where I wanted to be. Um, like Laurie, I have um, very clear memories of some of the first children that I that I looked after um, and not just the children but their families and what I valued very much was um, getting to know the families and this was a field of nursing that I decided to to stay in and went back to work um, first as a staff nurse on the paediatric oncology ward um, in Leeds and then became a ward sister on the same ward. Um, that period as a ward sister is in many ways some of the most, uh, one of the most rewarding roles that I, that I had during my career, where you know every day what a difference you're making, not just to children, young people and, and their families, but to the team that you have around you. And I think it's a role that is often um, perhaps not valued as much as it, it should be, but it's um, a really valuable role in making sure that services run safely and that children are, are well cared for. So that was a, a role that I enjoyed and, and stayed in, as you can see, for um, 20, more than 20 years. Um, and then, but what I also realized, and this is something that I will um, come back to as I talk, that sometimes you need to be able to be at a different level in order to influence change and to make a difference. And so I moved a little bit away from the bedside um, to become the lead nurse for, for children's cancer in Leeds. So during the time that, that took me from my time as a student nurse to to my time as a, a lead nurse for children's cancer, then always underpinning that was my um, own personal and, and professional development. So that very much followed the roles that I took rather than again being, being planned. So that having trained first as a, a, an adult nurse and then as a children's nurse, I then, when I um, realized that pediatric oncology was the place that I was gonna stay, then I undertook specialized training um, here in the, the UK. And as I developed in my role from that of a ward sister to a lead nurse, I recognized a need for um, greater underpinning of my practice and undertook at that stage a, a master's degree. Now, Amita, um, introduced me as an honorary nurse advisor in children's cancer. That's because I have now retired from the clinic, from my clinical practice 
but I remain a registered nurse. I remain active in, in pediatric oncology. And so when I think about my development, actually retirement has been um, an important part of my professional development, learning, um, taking new opportunities and, and new skills. So it carries on underneath. And although um, I think we, I'm you know, sharing some of what I've learned with those who are at a, a uh, towards the beginning of their careers, I think there's also some things I might want to say to some of those um, of, of my peers who are maybe beginning to think about what the future holds in, in terms of us as their career moves on. So um, that gives you an overview of, of my professional career up until where we are now. Um, and I just want to reflect on some of the things um, that I've learned along the way. And actually really, um, Laurie's points about stories really resonated with me because I think one of the most important things that I've learned is about the importance of listening and in particular to hearing children and families telling their stories. You can hear so much, you can hear so much about what brought them there um, and you can hear, learn about how as a nurse, as a healthcare professional, or any healthcare professional, how we can really um, make a difference to the experience that they that they come with. So I think listening to children and families, listening to them telling their stories is probably the greatest um, lesson of my professional life. But equally, um, listening to members of your team. So I think um, that while caring for children and young people has been one of the um, great joys of my professional life, so has been building, um, sustaining and developing the teams, uh, the teams that I've worked with. Um, and listening is important there to understand what matters to individuals um, and to understand what makes people work, what makes you able to support them to give of their very best in the workplace. But the other people that you sometimes need to listen to are those who you want to influence in whatever sphere you, you work in. Again, you need to understand what it is that they're looking for and to think about how what you do can contribute to their own agenda so that you can make the change that, that you want to see. So listening is, is critical. But I think also one of the things I've learned is to take the opportunities that, that come along because you really don't know where they'll lead you and you don't know the skills that they will give you. And those skills can then help you as you um, develop to look for, for more opportunities. And then looking back, you can see where um, some of this was, uh, was taking you. But at, even at the time, you don't realise that's really... Um, where you were where you were going. I think for almost anyone in the healthcare workforce and in fact um, for, for people, we want to make a difference. You hear that so often when I interview people for a job, why do you want this job? It's because I want to make a difference. And so it's finding the ways that you can make a difference in the work that you do is really important. Mentorship is important. Um, Laurie has talked to, uh, about that. I know um, that others, others will do so. But I think for me, the most important thing has been the professional friendships of, of peers and finding the people who become your people. So um, at the top of the, my screen, you will see some of the women that I trained with as a nurse some 40 years ago and had the great pleasure of celebrating the wedding of one of them just um, a couple of weeks ago. So those are people who have always been there through my professional career. And the other people who've been really important to me, to me have been my paediatric oncology nursing peers here in the United Kingdom. And people will, I'm sure, be recognising um, Professor Faith Gibson in, in the middle of the, the bottom screen. And this is a group of Again, women who we've worked together on the national level since um, the 80s in looking at how we can make a difference to children's cancer care and nursing care in the UK. 
one of the other things that I've learned along the way, and this is um, directed perhaps a bit more to nurses who may be listening today, is that I hope I have never said that I'm just a nurse, because that's something that I hear all too often from nurses. And nursing in the UK, at least, is a majority female profession. Um, Amita talked earlier about the percentage of the global health workforce that is um, female. Now, of course, more than 50% of the um, global health workforce is, are nurses. And in the UK, 90% um, of nurses are women. And I'm very aware that's different in, in a number of different countries. And nursing has too often been seen as, as unskilled, as women's work, and can sometimes be undervalued. But we see leadership in nursing everywhere. It's often invisible. And it's really important that we're able as nurses to articulate what it is that nurses do and to value the profession and the contribution that we make. And I'd just like to um, highlight to those who are nurses, but also to others, two really important um, writers and thinkers in, in this regard. So Suzanne Gordon um, and her books From Silence to Voice and Jennifer Jackson, who's recently done a lot of work on articulating what it is that nurses do and contribute not only to patient care, but to healthcare systems. So um, one of the things is never to say, I am just a nurse. And then finding the places where you can can make a difference and I think for wherever we are in, in, in the healthcare professions it's in the local setting where we begin to develop our skills, um, we establish the building blocks of our career and for many people that may take them to different organisations. Um, for me I stayed within the same organisation in, in Leeds but then reached out to look at where I could make a difference at um, the national level and for me that was through our Royal College of Nursing and I think very important to um, contribute to and be involved in the work of a professional body um, whichever profession you you come from and our children's cancer and leukemia group again thinking at that national level about how we can um, develop services further for, for children and young people. Amita has mentioned um, my involvement with SIOP. Laurie mentioned um, SIOP as well, such a critical organisation um, for making a difference to children's cancer care um, on, a, on the international level. And certainly that for me has been um, some of the most rewarding work that I've done. And particularly in these um, later stages of my career when I, my focus shifted more to the um, international arena where again I've made um, such strong professional friendships which sustain um, the work that we are all able to do. But I think it's also important for us as healthcare professionals to think about how we contribute to civic society and for some that's through um, politics, for others that's through um, faith organisations, for me, it's been through the work of charitable organisations. So here in the UK, our national children's charity, Young Lives Against Cancer, um, and then um, World Ch Cancer UK, which I'm sure many on the call will, will know about and where I've been able to take the knowledge and skills developed through my career to this point to a wider stage. And I think that's where I'm... Um, sort of directing some of my thoughts to those who are coming towards perhaps those later stages of the career to think about how we can continue to make a contribution to make a difference because it's by making a difference that we also um, can gain what I think can be one of the most rewarding things which is the recognition of our peers um, and I think um, for me one of my proudest moments was um, being awarded the SIOP Nursing Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, but just recently, um, I was awarded the fellowship of the uh, Queen's Nursing Institute, a, an institute of nursing in, in the UK, and was um, very privileged to receive that alongside Elizabeth Iro from the WHO uh, and Howard Catton, who's the um, 
chief executive of the International Council of Nurses. And when I think back to where I started some 40 years ago, it's that importance of taking opportunities, recognizing the value that you can make um, and taking that forward um, into a career. So um, thank you. And I'm sorry, I see, I think I've gone a little over my time. So my apologies for that. So uh, that um, thing looks very lovely. And thank you so much, Rachel. That was wonderful. And, uh, you know, people like you, you don't retire. It's like you re you get retired, you know. So it's, and I, I think um, most of us, when we've been growing up, have been taught that a nurse is like Florence Nightingale. And, you know, they should be respected totally all lifelong. And I think we'll go on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Noreen Mushtaq from Pakistan. So she is an associate professor and pediatric neuro-oncologist. And as her slide says, she's from Pakistan. She's a section head of the pediatric oncology at the Aga Khan University at Karachi. And she has established pediatric neuro-oncology services at Dehar hospital with the help of an excellent twinning initiative with the Hospital of Sick Children in Toronto. She has developed national uh, pediatric brain tumor boards across Pakistan with the help of the My Child Matters grant from Sanofi Aventis for capacity building in pediatric neuro-oncology services. So she leads the pediatric oncology uh, team uh, and has developed the, the national guidelines for treatment in Pakistan for the treatment of the most common brain tumors. So thank you for being with us today, Noreen, and over to you. Thank we, we can't hear you, Noreen. Can you turn on the mic? Yeah, can you, can you hear me now? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much um, uh, and uh, hello everybody. And uh, thank you so much for joining today and thank you uh, Faith and um, Tessie for uh, inviting me to give a talk in this auspicious event of Sai Women's Leader in Pediatric Oncology Network. So as Avita has already told you that I'm from Pakistan So I born um, in uh, Karachi, uh, uh, Pakistan, and you all know that Pakistan is the fifth most populous country of the world. And it's been known for its, uh, you know, poverty, uh, terrorism, and corruptions. But you know, one thing you don't know that it's Pakistan is a landscape of beautiful mountains, uh, uh, lands, uh, uh, rivers, valleys, and you know, it could be a great destination for your next journey. So uh, I welcome you all to come and see Pakistan. It's really beautiful. So I'm the eldest um, and the only daughter of my parents. I'm married for the last 16 years and I have two sons and my husband is the greatest support, support I have in my life. So um, if uh, in, in, in education, so I graduated from some medical college uh, from Karachi. And then I started my internship from Aha University Hospital, which is uh, still uh, the place where I'm working as an associate professor for the last uh, 20 years. So after my internship, my intention was to uh, do child psychiatry. But you know, the man in this uh, picture, Dr. Abdul Ghaffar Bilo, who is the father of pediatric in Pakistan, and he's the inspiration behind uh, my decision, my ch decision changing that I have to take pediatrics because I, my personality suits pediatrics uh, medicine rather than child psychiatry. So during my residency, um, I have decided that I have to take pediatric oncology. And this is all because of Zehra Fadu, the beautiful woman on the, in, in the picture. And she is uh, the program director at the time and still my boss because she is the um, chair of a, a department of oncology at Ahan University Hospital. So the day I finished my residency, uh, pediatric residency, the uh, next day I joined pediatric being work program. And at the time I just got uh, married and uh, got pregnant very soon. So it was like a, you know, a very difficult time for me and for Zera, who uh, basically the, the supporting 
um, system for me and she's always there to help me out. And it's because of her all help and support that I have been able to complete my pediatric oncology uh, fellowship program uh, in three years. So in 20, 2009, I completed my fellowship of pediatric oncology uh, at AKU. And then after five months, I joined again as the faculty in the Department of Pediatrics as a pediatric oncologist in 2010. So from uh, at the time, um, you know, I have uh, seen uh, really, um, you know, challenges and for the treatment of pediatric brain tumors. And, you know, although we have the basic infrastructure at AKU, um, uh, with good neuro, excellent neurosurgeons, a uh, 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 good uh, neuro radiology program. We have pathologists, we have uh, a radiation oncologist, but you know, we don't have a dedicated pediatric neuro oncology team. So this is the same story across Pakistan. So pediatric neuro oncology is one of the most neglected field. And you know, when I talk with my seniors and people who are doing pediatric oncology for the last 10 years, they were thinking, you know, we are still fighting on, uh, uh, treating children with leukemia, lymphoma, retino, and VIMS. So really, it is really difficult that we develop something, uh, an MDT or maybe tumor goals or capacity building um, of neuro-oncology with, with the neurosurgeons in Pakistan. So it's a big no-no. It's really difficult. You can try, but I, I don't think that you'll be able to do that. So... Um, So, um, uh, but fortunately I got um, uh, the faculty development award uh, awarded by the Aachen University in 2013. And then I have decided to um, take my specialty training um, of pediatric neuro-oncology from sick kids. And there as uh, uh, someone has really said that choose your mentors, but actually I was not, I, I did, did not choose my mentor, but it, I actually blessed with one of the best mentor. Um, and, um, So uh, find a great mentor who believes in you and your life will change forever. And my mentor is Dr. Buffet. So he's the man who basically, when I went there and he asked me, Noreen, what do you want to do when you go back to Pakistan? So I told him, you know, I cannot do whatever you are doing, like such um, highly specialized treatment and targeted therapy and clinical trial. But what I can do is that I can improve the quality of life of my children and maybe I'll develop a pediatric neuro-oncology dedicated team first at AKU and maybe after some time in Pakistan. So he said, okay, let's start something. So we have started this twinning initiative back in 2014 when I came back to Pakistan. Uh, and since then it had been running successfully every month. So it was started with the help of monthly tumor board, uh, which was uh, Zoom linked. And uh, it's not only with AKU, but we have we, we have joined hands with uh, other colleagues in Karachi and one of my uh, friend and colleague uh, from <clears throat> Indus Hospital, Dr. Sayyid Amar Hamad, he's the one who basically joined hands with me. And you know he's always there to support uh, children of brain tumor at his center. And uh, he's the one who basically, uh, you know, helped to develop pediatric neuro-oncology in Karachi. So uh, in this program, we basically invited neurosurgeons, pedi neurosurgeon pediatric oncologists across Karachi, uh, radiologists, radiation oncologists, and pathologists. And we uh, discussed uh, patients from um, three to four centers of Karachi. And then, you know, uh, with the help of this, this initiative, we have uh, developed management guidelines of our patient. We have more referrals. We have... Uh, uh, we have basically have, uh, 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 so our patients have, be have better uh, quality of life. So um, uh, after this, um, it's not only that we have started this uh, tumor, pro tumor boards program, but we have, we have also started um, uh, having targeted therapy in Pakistan as compassionate access uh, through our compassionate access program. We have sent samples to sick kids where many of our uh, patients got a proper and appropriate diagnosis and treatment uh, will be the treatment was provided accordingly. So, you know, this, this whole program helped us immensely. So after this, we have established a pediatric neuro-oncology dedicated team first at Aachen Hospital, then Dr. Emer started a dedicated neuro-oncology team at Indus Hospital. And we uh, also 
um, uh, helped other centers to develop their pediatric neuro-oncology services in Karachi. But the, on, uh, we just recently published one of the paper um, in pediatric blood and cancer about our seven year long training program initiative. It's about building the ecosystem of pediatric neuro-oncology care in Pakistan. So then uh, we, we were fortunate enough to got this grant in 2019. So the capacity building we have started first at AKU, uh, we then intend to develop this capacity building across other centers of Pakistan. So um, uh, this is by Child, Mat uh, Child Matter Grant, by Child Matter Grant and by Sanofi. And it's not only myself that was I have started this, but uh, I've started with five of my colleagues. So uh, uh, if you see that this man is one of the best pediatric radiation oncologists, is Dr. Bilal Masar Qureshi. He is part of his, uh, our team, uh, my nurse, Anam, who is really great in helping our patients all along. Uh, Dr. Shazad Nidesham, who is the first uh, pediatric palliative care physician in Pakistan. Dr. Salman Kirmani, who is uh, a, uh, pediatric chair, and he's a geneticist and endocrinologist. Uh, uh, Dr. Hurum Minas is the pathologist who help us all along to develop our uh, initiative first uh, at AKU. And then he's the one who helped me all along to develop capacity building across Pakistan. And Dr. Gohar Javed, who is the best neurosurgeon uh, of Pakistan. So with the help of my team, we have established a network of tumor boards. So we are doing four tumor boards per month. And uh, from 2019 till now, we had around 108 uh, sessions of tumor boards and discussed more than 480 cases, uh, uh, per 400 cases till now. So this, this whole program helped us a lot and uh, helped our colleagues in 13 different public sector, public or private sector hospitals in Pakistan. So it's not only that uh, you know, they developed their own multidisciplinary teams, but they also developed treatment guidelines. They are also discussing their uh, patients among, uh, among themselves. And, you know, all this process helped developing these pediatric neuro-oncology services in many centers across Pakistan. So we uh, have also um, have had uh, two or three workshops before COVID and two more, and it was uh, attended by more than 200 participants. And with the help of all these capacity building services, we were fortunate enough to organize our first National Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Symposium in 2020, which was all uh, virtual and it was attended by more than 1,100 participants across 58 countries. Then we had our second Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Symposium last year, which was attended by more than 1,100 participants again. Um, it was a hybrid session and these are the participants of the uh, symposium. So we have also organized more than 40 uh, lectures, pediatric neuro-oncology lecture series uh, since 2020. And uh, it was attended not only by participants from Pakistan, but across the world um, and about uh, participants from 48 countries. So this capacity building also help us to develop national guidelines so, so we have developed Pakistan national guidelines for the diagnosis of low grade glioma, uh, endorsed by the Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology and Pakistan Society of uh, Neuro Oncology. We have also established guidelines for the management of medulloblastoma and guidelines for the management of pediatric high grade glioma. So, um, um, after although uh, this whole activity helped helped centers a lot. And treat, so, so they are, you know, uh, improving and treating their patients uh, well. But you know, there are many patients who are unable to go uh, to those centers. So, um, you know, to to improve the delay diagnosis and to, to uh, improve the accessibility of uh, the patient to the hospitals, we developed this first portal by the name of Children Brain Tumor Initiative Pakistan. And if you click that portal, you can. Uh, so anyone who has a child with brain tumor, any parents, caregivers, any um, a doctor, they can register uh, the child with brain tumor here. And when they, they, they click here, the, this form is open. And in this form, you can just uh, put the information, the basic information. Um, it's, it's both in Urdu and English. Uh, click the symptoms and upload the picture of the scan or any histopathology. So once it was uploaded, it's uploaded. So they will have this thank you message. And after the thank you message, uh, uh, 
what we will do, we will call them uh, every Friday, 4 to 5 p.m., and we will develop the treatment. Uh, we will tell them the treatment management guidelines and how they will be able to manage their patients. So if a patient is uh, residing in, in a small village or in a town, so we will, con we will collaborate them with the near center, uh, 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 the, the collaborating center of our program. So they will take their child to that center and you know the treatment will be started and they have a better outcome. So this whole activity is not possible without the help of my senior colleagues, Dr. Shamil Ashraf, who has started pediatric oncology in Pakistan, Dr. Asim Rivami, who is the president of Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology, my dear neurosurgeon, Dr. Athar Inam, who is the president of Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, and many of my colleagues, uh, neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, my friends, and doctors across Pakistan in those 13 centers who helped to uh, make this initiative successful and who are treating and work tirelessly to improve the outcome of children in their own centers. So not to uh, forget to mention my patients and their families and my two lovely fellows. So as part of this pediatric neuro-oncology initiative, we have also started pediatric neuro-oncology fellowship at Aarha University Hospital. And earlier next, next year, we will have three pediatric neuro-oncologists in Pakistan. So I finished my presentation on this picture. So my boys are uh, big now. So, and you know, um, uh, so all this initiative cannot be possible with the help of my friends, the support system, my family, my parents, and of course, uh, my mentor who is always there to help me out and without whom I may not be here and uh, telling you my story. So uh, my, the lessons I, I have learned during all this journey is that everything is possible. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. Just if, if there's difficulties in life, just take a deep breath, step back and then move forward. So your family, friends, music, traveling and nature are the healing uh, uh, objects in your life. So thank you for patience listening. Thank you everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Noreen, for that wonderful, inspirational said, uh, thing that, you know. So it's like the Nike advertisement, which says, just do it. So I think that's the message which you know everybody can get, that you can just do it. And we've come to the end of our three absolutely amazing uh, talks by three wonderful women. And I think I'll hand over the mic to Faith now to carry on with the question and answer session. Thank you, Amita, and thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Fabulous leaders uh, in their field. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen, and I have to remember to uh, speak not so fast. Um, my job, um, just to bring us to a close, really, is to help with some of the questions we've had in the Q&A. And I would encourage you, please, to add, add into the Q&A. We may not get through all of those questions in the time we have, but we can certainly go back to you uh, with some responses. And you can write your questions in French or in Spanish, remember, because they will be uh, translated. Um, we are due to finish at uh, two o'clock. But if we go just over that, then that is absolutely fine. Um, I... There are some questions already in the Q&A, so I'm going to start um, there. Um, obviously, some fabulous comments about how great it was to listen to uh, people. And then I've got a question from uh, Brigitte Muller, um, and this is to Laurie. Have you ever received pushback for being a woman? That's a great question. And yeah. hey, Bagina. Um, you know, the first half of my career um, at NIH, there the um, branch chiefs were men. Um, you know, I never applied for that kind of leadership position, which all most of the leadership positions were men at the time. So I've been very fortunate that um, really women have been provided with opportunities to be able to to grow and to do the work that they want to be able to do. But I think as you move up the ladder and into some of those directorship positions, it's still pretty heavily men. I would hope that this has really been changing. Um, and um, 
but I've been fortunate for myself for the kind of work that I'm doing, that it hasn't been a challenge. Thank you. And I guess I'm just going to follow that on with a question um, from Courtney. Uh, Courtney Sullivan, who is a, a nurse, um, and it's a great question, and it, obviously it's saying great trailblazers we've listened to. And this is really, this anybody could um, have a stab at this, um, but Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what are some of the key ingredients, words of wisdom you could share with us that kept you going along the way? That's a nice question. It is a nice question. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and I think it was a couple in terms of what's kept me going along the way. I think it's some of the things that I highlighted actually in my talk, which is those um, professional friends that and supporters and mentors who you can who you can go to um, and talk through anything. But I think in, I think probably the most important thing is about making a difference finding a way to make a contribution, whatever that is. And sometimes that's very immediate. So when you're at the bedside, that is, um, you know, can be generally very immediate, but sometimes it takes a long time. And I think sometimes for me, it's looking back at a change that may have taken five, 10 years to come to fruition and recognizing that, you know, something that you have done has made a change, has had an impact, has made a difference. Um, even though it might take a long time to recognise that. And I guess that's the benefit of being able to look back um, over the lifetime of a, of a career. Thank you, Rachel. Noreen, would you add anything to that? What would be your, what's kept you going, other than the lovely pictures you showed us of um, uh, the outdoor, your family, all those great things. What else would you add? Um for all my dear colleagues um it's so life is all all there for you so uh, there are there are uh, struggles and uh, very difficult phases in your life and there are phases in which i used to say okay i just leave everything i just don't want to you know carry on but as i said take a deep breath um so your family your friends and your patients are there to help you out and your achievements, um, which keeps you going. So everything, any, anything can be possible and anyone can do that. That's my advice for everyone. Thank you, thank you. Laurie, would you add anything before? We've now got lots of questions coming in, but Laurie, what would you add on to that one? I think you've heard some wonderful suggestions. I think we get really caught up in what we're doing and we end up in a silo. So if you're just doing clinical work or you're just doing research, to expand and to do something a little bit different. And I think that helps you to grow. It helps you to recognize the importance of what you're doing. It helps you to be better at what you're doing, but expand outside of your silo and try something different. And it may be just connecting with a colleague who's um, you know, doing a project that you may wanna be um, involved with and to be able to learn from them. But there is always learning to be done. Getting too comfortable in one place, it will stop people from being able to expand and to be able to grow in their respective fields. Thank you. Um, Laurie, I'm going to sneak in one of my own questions to you before I go on to the, the highlights here. But um, and everybody spoke about uh, mentors, but just how do you choose a mentor? I'm not sure we are ever really clear on how we do. How do we go about that? Everybody spoke about them, but how do we choose? Well, sometimes they, you know, it happens by happenstance, you know, and where you're working. But if you are interested in a certain area um, and you know that there is a leader in that area, I just say reach out to them and to be able to let them know who you are and to see if they were willing to be able to give you a little bit of time to be able to talk about your career trajectory, things you want to learn, if they have projects you can participate in. I found that people are really open. They may not have any time, but when it comes to junior um, faculty or people who are relatively new in the field, people want to share the, their lessons. And if they can you know, be able to help you I have found that they will refer you to somebody else who can, but it's taking that first step and reaching out to someone who is involved in an area that you would like to be able to learn more about. 
I like that idea of taking the first step. I think that's a really important thing. Um, I, get, I get emails all the time from people, you know, in different areas or dyadic coping or just something that they've seen that I've published and, and it's, um, it's welcoming. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and then um, Kathy Pritchard Jones, many of you I know will know Kathy, who's our past president of uh, uh, SIOP. And, and she's asked a question, which I'm going to ask of each of you. Um, Noreen, I'd start with you. So um, what, um, what's your, the most important advice you'd give to a female healthcare professional wishing to develop their leadership skills? And you'll each have a chance to answer this. Noreen, what would you? What's the most important thing you'd get advice you'd give to one of your female colleagues? It's actually hard work, persistence, hard work, and patience. Um, I think anything can be achievable. So, but when you lose your patience, um, you know, when things are not going right, so that's the thing that, you know, can cause hurdles. So it's, so just, you know, continue your hard work with patience and perseverance and you will achieve your, your goal. Rachel, anything you'd add? What would you give to a female uh, healthcare professional? Nurse or doctor, yeah? Yeah, so so I think just building on what um, Noreen has, has said is about that, you know, when things don't go right. And I think being, you know, prepared to fail, being prepared to get things wrong sometimes, and then to learn, to learn from those, um, to to learn from our failures, I think. Now, I think there are one of the things that I don't think any of us have, have mentioned really, but you know, there are, there is formal leadership training. And for some people that can be really helpful. And I've certainly um, experienced uh, formal leadership training, looked for that or found it in, in other places. And I think that for someone who is feeling lacking in confidence, then sometimes going out and finding something formal is helpful. But otherwise, I think some of the other things we've talked about, you know, mentorship, support of, of friendship, then mentorship can also help you. If if, men, if leadership is the thing you want to um, build, then look for a leader. And that could be someone that, as, as uh, Laurie has talked about, reaching out to a mentor, then to reach out to that person. Thank you, Rachel. Laurie, what would your advice be? I think you've heard wonderful advice. I have learned so much more from the things that didn't go well than the things that did go well. But you have to listen to that voice and learn from that. If there's a leadership position you're interested in, learn about what the requirements are. Um, people that have succeeded in that position and those who have not, find out what you're missing. Let people know that you're interested in that. Again, mentors could be able to help you. Um, and, you know, if there are certain training that you need or there are certain steps that you need to um, take care of along the way to get that position, um, then that will help you get to that goal. But always um, take time for yourself and don't get so caught up in the leadership that you lose track of what you're doing right now. I think that sometimes happens. And if you don't take time for your own wellness, you'll be forced to take time for your own illness at some point in time. And unfortunately, I have seen that as well. Thank you, Laurie. Um, now, I'm mindful, I can see the number of participants and I can see we're dropping slightly. So I think we should be thinking of wrapping it up, although it's been absolutely uh, fabulous. And, and I, one of the things I wanted to say is, um, doesn't matter where you are in your career, I still learn things um, all of the time. So I've learned a huge amount and, and I've certainly got uh, quotes from each of you um, uh, written down that will take me through uh, the rest of my career, certainly. And there are some questions here that are very specific to people, which are not necessarily about being um, a, a female leader in the field. So I'm going to leave some of those um, and end by saying, Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I hope we can continue to do these. Um, it's always thinking, will they work? Will they not work? But actually, I think people uh, are enjoying them and taking something away from them. And of course, there will be uh, recordings. Let me go into the next slide. Whoops, where are you? Oh, there you are, you've moved on, thank you. Um, we will have more of these events um, that I hope you'll be able to join us. Um, we'll have one in April that will be online. Uh, we're planning to have a, a, another one um, in May, 
Um, and we are going to try and link them into some of our SIOP meetings. Uh, this is the plan going forward. Um, and we'll have one in uh, 2023 at our Congress, which is in uh, Ottawa and Canada. Um, so these will continue. Um, and certainly if you want to give us any feedback on how it's been for you as a, a participant or somebody who has been listening, then please let us know. We really want to be responsive to give people what they want from these uh, groups. And if you want to nominate uh, a woman leader from any professional group, um, please um, email us and we want to keep this variety going. Because I think, again, as you can see, you learn from different people who've been in, in, in different posts, which is, um, which is great. And I think I have one more slide, which is obviously to say thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Um, much gracious and that's my, my best in terms of language that I can I can sum it up but please if you or anybody who's joined us today if you're not um, a site member please do consider joining us um, do of course follow us on social media and we want to hear from you and um, I just want to end by saying thank you so much and to Katie who's been busy uh, drawing some of the things that we've been saying all of that will be shared too so you'll be able to see illustrations um, from our talks today and I'm just going to check if there's anything that I've forgotten from uh, Tessie. Uh, Faith can you stop sharing your screen so we can see the drawing? Yeah I can. Can I bring the drawing up bigger? Ah brilliant thank you Katie. Thank you. Thank you very much Katie it looks amazing. Thank you very much always good thank you Katie that's great um uh Tessie uh anything um else we need to say to close this obviously thank you to everybody who's been part of this in terms of the organization behind the scenes front scene and of course to our interpreters uh Tessie anything no thank you very much to uh, our audience and to uh, all the questions that we heard and also to our translators and our amazing speakers, we really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. And enjoy the rest of your day, however short or long it may be in whatever country you are in. So thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.